today, I want to talk about how to approach God. How to approach God. Because we all want a relationship with God, as long as you believe that God exists. In fact, even if you believe that God is mostly apathetic towards things on earth, you want to have some sort of relationship with God. Despite even often years of neglect, everyone really desires a relationship with God. In fact, I would even argue that it's in your very being, that, that it's in your very DNA, that we all desire a relationship with our creator. So one question I get asked, and I get asked this one question in many different ways, is how am I supposed to approach God? How am I supposed to approach this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving being? And I usually get asked this question in several different ways. For example, I get asked, how do I pray? How am I supposed to talk to this God? There's only one of him. I've never experienced anything like him. So how am I supposed to communicate with him? What am I supposed to say when I pray? How am I supposed to say it? Is there any magical words that I'm supposed to use? Is there a right way to pray? Or I get asked the question, how do I draw near to God? That's the same question, right? How do I approach God? Do I have to clean myself up before approaching him? Do I have to do a certain class or a ritual? What do I have to do to draw near to God? Or I get asked, how do I read the Bible? Now, you might not think that this is a question of how do I approach God, but we believe that this word, the Bible, is the very words of God. How am I supposed to take his words and then apply it to my life? Do I have to know every answer? Do I have to graduate from a seminary? Or is he supposed to show me? And if he does show me, how does that work? Or I even get asked, how do I worship God? These are all the same question. How am I supposed to, as a human, approach a holy God? And understanding the answer to this question really changes your entire mentality when it comes to the Christian walk. It changes how you live, it changes how you pray, it changes everything about you. In fact, the way that we answer this question affects the question, what does a relationship with God really look like? So today, this is what I want to talk about. I want to look at the question of how do I approach God and what does my relationship to Him look like? So if you will, go ahead and open the word of God to Mark chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 13. And I want to show you four lessons, four lessons on approaching God. And the first thing I want you to see as we read the first couple of verses is come as you are. Come as you are. Let's see what's happening here. It's starting in verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. So what's happening? The parents are bringing their children to Jesus so they could be blessed by the good teacher. In fact, this is a normal tradition. It, Hebrew mothers were accustomed in this manner to seek a blessing for their children from the presidents of synagogues who would lay their hands on them. In fact, it says in the Talmud, Talmud. After the father of the child had laid his hands on his child's head, he led them to the elders one by one, and they also blessed him and prayed that he might grow up famous in the law, faithful in marriage, and abundant in good works. So it is a normal traditional thing to find someone who you respect to come, lay their hands on your children, and bless them. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. However, we see the disciples start to rebuke them. Say, how could you do this? Don't you know who you're talking to and driving them away? Now, I like to think the best of the disciples. So I think what they were doing was trying to be commendable at least. The disciples seem to believe that the blessing of these children is an unneeded interruption of Jesus' time. After all, Jesus had many important things to do, right? 
He had people to heal. He had places to go. He had sermons to preach. And not only that, but Jesus has been running to absolute exhaustion for, what, 10 chapters now? And children are, during this time, are seen as outcast. And they're not worthy of attention. And they're often a nuisance. In fact, even though we have a higher view of children, right, because we see them as a lot of potential and we see them as the future, uh, when you talk to most people, they kind of treat children the same way. They're a nuisance. They're not really worthy of my time. Uh, I, you'd be surprised how many people are not kid people. And so they're rebuking all these people and trying to drive them away. Look at how Jesus responds to this situation, though. Verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of God. Jesus, it says, became indignant. This is what the ESV uses, and I think that this is a very good translation of the Greek here. And what that means is feeling or showing anger or annoyance at what is perceived as un fair treatment so what's happening is here are these children and here are these parents who are probably outcasts who most people would see wow this is a real waste of my time don't you know how important I am don't you know how how busy I am and yet you're coming and you're bringing these children to me with their grubby hands and their crusty mouths like no but Jesus says no 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 These are the people I want to be with. Again, he says, do not hinder them, for such belong to the kingdom of God. And maybe you're coming here today, and you really identify with those children. And you feel like you're an outcast, that most people throw you to the side. They don't give you the time of day. Uh, You're not particularly rich or influential or educated or skilled. And maybe there's days where you just don't feel good enough. And maybe today is one of those days. Where it took everything within you to get dressed and come to church. And you're probably lying to yourself on the way over here. No one cares if I'm here. No one cares if they see me. And yet I'm exerting all this effort to be here. And in fact, your feeling is so down, you might even ask the question, how could God love me? After all, look at the ways you've ran away from him, all the time that you've wasted. How could he love you when you don't even love yourself? Let me tell you, if this verse shows you anything, it's that Jesus wants you. Jesus wants you to come. No matter how you see yourself, no matter how others see you, no matter where you have been or what you have done, Jesus wants you to come as you are. Maybe some of you guys came here feeling really secure. That this isn't speaking to you at all. Outcast, no. When you come, you feel important. You feel encouraged. Well, I think there's an application here for you too. And that is the question, how do you treat the outcast? How do you treat those who need help, who look differently than you, who honestly annoy you? Those who take you out of your comfort zone. How do you treat those who most people would avoid? Jesus makes clear those who we would consider last must be treated best of all. And let me just give you some practical application. This is stuff that you could be looking forward to right now. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Which means that you should probably love all the little children, all the children of the world, right? And if you want a chance to serve the least of these, let me encourage you to volunteer your time with the children. As we start seeing more and more young families come, as we start to see more children, you might not consider yourself a person that's really good with children. Well, why don't you give it a second shot? Let me encourage you to not consider it babysitting, but look to bless and show the children who Jesus is. 
And this isn't just the small children. This is the youth. You might think, I don't know what to tell a 14-year-old kid. Good. When you start talking to them, you'll find the words. You might even be saying, what am I supposed to do? I'm not cool anymore. I'm not young anymore. How am I supposed to relate to them? Be their grandma. Be their grandpa. They need that. They just need people to come around them and love them. So let me encourage you that as we start to see the people come, don't just sit to the side saying it's not your gift or you're too old or any other excuse. But let me encourage you to step up and love those whom God has directly called you to love. And not only are we called to love the children, but we are called to be like children ourselves. Let's take a look at that. This is my second point that I want you to see. Come as a child. Come as a child. In verse 15, this is what it says. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Do you see this? Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, guess what? You can't enter it. Verse 16, and he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying hands on him. So what in the world is this talking about? Yes, this is talking about childlike faith, but what does that mean and what does that look like? Well, let me ask this question. How do children approach their parents? I want you to think of a kid who's about three, four, five years old. How do they approach their parents? Children in times of joy and trouble and any other time approach their parents with full trust and full love. In fact, when I see a child that hasn't seen their dad all day and they have a loving father, one of the things they do is they smile, they run, they're excited, and then they jump at their father. And it is now that father's job to catch that child because that child has come to him in full trust and full love. They are welcomed. In times of trouble, they look to their parents for help. In times of joy, they look to their parents to celebrate them. And in times, all the times in between, they are fully loved and fully welcomed. And we're called to approach God in the same way. Fully loving and fully trusting God. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us then with confidence. How much more confidence is there than a child that dives at their parents? With confidence you draw near to the throne of grace. Why? That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Much like a child, we are called to go to God. A child cannot do anything by themselves. So where do they go? They go to their parents. And we can't do anything for ourselves, so where must we go? To our Father. To God. Let me ask the question, too, how do children get things? How do they get things? Almost always, they have to ask a parent or an adult. They have no ability to get what they actually need when they need it. For younger children, even with activities that they could do by themselves, they must ask their parents or guardians for permission. We don't just let our kids run across the street at Walmart, right? They could. They have the ability. But you make them hold your hand. When you're out in public, they could go to the bathroom by themselves, but you probably need to take them there. Why? Why do we do this? It is for their protection. It is for their education. And ultimately, it's for their good. If this is the case, should we not be holding our Savior's hand every step that we take for our protection, for our education, and ultimately for our good? And this is seen most of all in our salvation. Because salvation is not something that you can earn for yourself. You must go to God the Father. You must approach His throne with confidence that you may receive mercy and find grace 
in your time of need. Salvation must be given to us. That's the whole reason Jesus came. If you could earn it, if you could do it with your skills and your ability and your goodness and your everything that you have, the wealth of resources that you possess, then Jesus wouldn't have come. Jesus came because you needed him. That's why he left heaven where he had all the wealth and all the riches and everything that you would ever want to be born of a virgin, to be born a child, to live life, to live a perfect life, to teach us about the kingdom and die on the cross and rise three days later so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. It's now up to you whether you want to hold the Savior's hand and obtain eternal life, or you want to continue walking in your own way like you have it all figured out. Walking faithfully means we walk in total faith that God will give us what we need. In times of goodness, we're still walking in faith. And in times of trouble and storms, when we don't even feel good about ourselves, we walk in faith knowing that God has so much for us and God has loved us so deeply. And to do this like a child, we must humble ourselves. And to show this, I, I want to show you a story that you might know. It's the story of the rich young ruler. And it's going to be right here in verses 17 through 25. But I want to sum up this story for you so we can move just a little more quickly. So what's happening? There's a rich young ruler. This is somebody who has youth. Right? He's young. He has abilities. He has skills. He has influence. He has wealth. He has everything that you would think that someone who is important would have. He is rich. He is a ruler. And he is considered a good man. We could tell this by the disciples' reaction to what Jesus is going to say. And the ruler comes to Jesus and asks a question. He says, good teacher... What must I do to inherit eternal life? Do you see what he says there? What must I do? The ruler is already showing that he is trusting in his own effort and in his own abilities and his own resources. And so what does Jesus do? He questions the ruler about goodness he says why do you call me good no one is good except for God alone so what he's doing is he's trying to bring the conversation around back to the goodness of God alone because Jesus even from the ruler's question realizes the ruler trusts in his own work and own goodness and does not realize how badly he needs Jesus's sacrifice So Jesus then asks him a question that's supposed to be a pointed question for the ruler to realize that he needs God. So he says, you know the commandments. In other words, you know what the test of goodness really is. You have to be perfect like God is perfect. He says, you know the commandments. And he starts listing the commandments. And then the ruler replies, teacher, all of these I've kept since my youth. He doesn't see that he needs help. He thinks he has it all figured out. In other words, he's saying, I'm a great guy. And being a great guy means I'm good and should be given eternal life. And I want you guys to take note of this. The ruler believes that he is good enough that Jesus should either congratulate him or give him the last couple of steps he needs to secure eternal life. Most people have the same mentality. That when you ask them, do you think that God thinks you are good? They say, absolutely. And I'm sure you're a great person. I'm sure you've done lots of good. I'm sure you've volunteered your time and you've given to worthy causes. I'm sure you're a great person. But when we compare ourselves to God who in himself is goodness. Boy, we really lack, don't we? We really come up short. 
And so Jesus knows the ruler's issue. The ruler has a pride problem. The ruler looked at all of his abilities and influence and wealth and allowed those things to dictate who he was, to give him real worth, and ultimately gave him an excuse not to look at God. We have to be so careful that our abilities and our wealth of resources and the things about ourselves don't identify us. But we are identified by totally trusting in God. Because when we start to say that I am this and I am that and I can do this and I could do that, guess what? Those are areas in your life that might be strengths. God bless you. But ultimately, they will make you turn away from God, not pray about those things, and keep trusting in yourself. That's not childlike faith. Childlike faith is... Father, I I need you. The ruler did not need God. He thought that God needed him. Do you get that? The ruler didn't think that he needed God. He thought God needed him. So Jesus gives instruction. He says, look, you lack one thing then. You want one last instruction? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, what is Jesus really asking here? Is Jesus saying that we should be poor? And if we're poor, then then we can follow Jesus. No, he realizes that all of the ruler's identity was all wrapped up in his wealth. All wrapped up in who he was as a leader. All wrapped up in his own abilities. Intangibly wrapped up in his money. So Jesus says, look, before you can follow me, you need to put those things to the wayside. You need to stop thinking you're so worthwhile because of the things that honestly God already gave to you. And you need to come to Jesus saying, Jesus, you are what I need more than anything. The wealth and the resources of the ruler were keeping him away from God. Take note of that. Because we are so susceptible to this ourselves That our resources, our wealth, our bank accounts, our ability to do our job well, our education, our seniority, Keep us away from actually going to God with everything. And how did the ruler respond? Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And so Jesus explains what exactly happened to the disciples. He said, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God of God. This wealth and riches he's talking about is not just tangible money. It is everything that we find valuable on earth. Again, the rich ruler had youth and strength and money and talents and skills and abilities. And what Jesus is saying is those who have those things, those things that the whole world wants in abundance, it's hard for them to come to God. Because in every situation, Their good looks have gotten them what they want. Their abilities in sports have given them what they want. Their smarts, their education have gotten them through the doors that they've wanted to go through. And they don't look to God. They look to themselves. When people have great wealth, or what we would refer to as blessings... It's hard for people to start trusting, to stop trusting in those things and actually start trusting in God. And if I were to be honest, this is the biggest problem in the church in America. This is it. This is the biggest problem. Because we rely far too much on our own resources and abilities and skills. And as long as we have a certain amount of money and staff and programs and things that we do, we pacify ourselves. We pacify ourselves into not being totally desperate for a move of God. 
We believe that if, as long as we are meeting our budget, we believe if we can make the worship music sound a certain way, if we can make the stage look just right, if certain programs are going well, if the pastoral staff is in, a, in, is in place and doing a good job, if we can get certain families in, if we could get a new building project going, if there are tangible things happening, then we must be doing everything right. Look at how God is blessing us, we say. But all we're doing is we're pacifying ourselves most of the time, thinking that if we build it, they will come. When God is asking for us to desperately seek after Him and what He's going to do. The issue is if we believe if our resources are in place, then God will do the rest. And brothers and sisters, this is not biblical. This is not a biblical way of looking at Christianity. This leads people to believing that they could throw their money at something or, or throw some people at an issue in the church and suddenly we're backing God's will. It leads to apathetic and anemic people that are focused on self. That's where the church has gone. And honestly, when I sit in my office, when I sit at home, when I'm imagining what we could do for the Lord, that's where my heart wants to go, that if only we had this or if only we had that. When the answer is, I should be on my knees praying to God, God, would you just do something? Because I know whatever God's going to do is better than whatever I could come up with. You might say, Brant, if that's not biblical, then what is biblical? It is biblical for us to become desperate for God to move. That's what it means to be like a child. We sit here and we pray and we pray and we pray and we say, God, you need to do something. God, would you do something? Would you bring revival? Would you bring people to us? Would you bring newness of life? So we have to begin to pray and pray and pray and pray until God begins to move. And let me tell you, this isn't hard. This isn't an abstract thought. This isn't hard to get our mind around. It's us praying, God, do something. In fact, if you want to know every single great revival, every single one without a miss, have all started with people brokenhearted for the loss and they have nowhere else to turn and so they pray until God moves every single revival without miss and then they continue to pray and keep their focus on joining what God is doing and not on the tangible things that they've accumulated and church, if I'm being honest, I'm going to tell you, this, this is my biggest fear, okay? So right now, I think that we're in a really good place, right? We have a level of desperation. We look around, and we see a lot of older faces. We see a lot of gray hair, and we don't see a lot of children, just being honest. And we recognize that if God doesn't begin to move, then the church is only going to last so long. I think this is a fair thing to say. If this is a surprise to somebody, look around for two seconds, right? So what are we doing? We're praying and praying and praying, and I know many of you are taking this very seriously. And I'm so blessed by that. And we want to see God move, and we want to see this church revitalized. But my biggest fear is what happens when we start to see success. When we get a few younger families in here. When we start to have some kids, and we start to have some youth. What happens when more people want to join the church? Younger families begin to invest. We see kids in youth programs. We see other ministers come on staff. When we see deacons and in leadership increase. And my goodness, let, let's even take this to the up to percent. Imagine that we start to see building projects. My gosh. And we're so big we can't even stay in here. My biggest fear is when we start to see just some of these things. A little bit of these things. Well, I'll take a deep breath and a sigh of relief because God moved. 
then we would begin to trust in our resources and our abilities and our wealth and not stay desperate about God moving. That's my biggest fear. And if we are going to join God in what he is doing, we cannot stop being desperate and we cannot stop praying for more. Our hearts cannot just break because our church doesn't look like we want it to. Our heart has to break because there are still people out there walking in darkness. In Pueblo, a lot of people walking in darkness. We must constantly be asking God to let us join in on what he is doing. We have to have the attitude of a child. When you are doing something and you have a little kid present, about three or four years old, what do they do? You're in the kitchen, you're making something. What what does the kid do? I'll tell you, when I went home for Christmas, we have a little niece, and she's about three. Isn't she, Emily? She's three years old. And her grandma was in the kitchen. She was making stuff. And the whole time, she was like, I want to help. I want to help. This is the attitude of a child. Children rarely come with the attitude of entitlement, that they could bring something better to the table than the adults. They don't come thinking that they bring anything worthwhile. Children come wanting to help. And even though they might slow you down or they might struggle, they want to be a part of what is going on. Do you see where I'm going with this, church? This is the attitude we have to have. Not the attitude of we bring something great to the table. Not the attitude of we bring something worthwhile. We just go, God, we just want to be a part of you working. We know that you're moving. We know that you're wanting to change lives. We know we can see it. It's all around us. We just want to be a part of it. This is the heart that God wants for us. You do not bring anything worthwhile. Your resources and talents and skills and abilities have been completely given to you by God in the first place. God does not want us to come believing we can do it. He wants us to come believing he can do it. And that like a child, we beg and we plead until we can be a part of what's going on. So where's your heart this morning? Maybe your heart is that you believe that God really needs you. You come to church and you volunteer because you think without you, God can't move and the church would just crumble. You take pride in what you bring to the church and this makes you not want to do other things in the church because you're already doing your part. In other words, you don't want to do, or you just want to do what you want, but not willing to do the less desirable things. So you might not say that you bring a lot to the table, but I could guarantee you when you have the attitude that you don't want to do this because you're already doing your part or you're already doing this and it doesn't really fit with your skills, that's having the attitude that God could use you and you don't really need God. You feel justified in complaining over preferences but not willing to do any tangible worth to make those changes. And let me be clear, no matter how great your skills and resources are, it is this attitude that will keep us from pursuing God, and it is this attitude that will keep us from experiencing revival. This attitude of God can use me, but I'm good. In fact, A.W. Tozer says, God cannot use a man or woman greatly until he wounds them deeply. God cannot use, oh, there we go. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And I think this is true. Before God can use you, he has to humble you. And this is not to suggest that we look for great suffering suffering until God humbles you to the point of putting your ability, skills, and resources and pride aside. This is suggesting that we need to fully trust in him. 
that he will bring us what we need. So either you believe that God needs you or maybe you just don't care about what God is doing. It's a reality. You could be sitting here right here and you really don't care what God is doing or not. You feel that you are busy enough that you only have time to really think about God on Sunday mornings and nothing more. And maybe you believe unless the church or God is doing something exciting, then why should you focus on God's work at all? After all, isn't he taking care of it already? If you're not filling your life up with the great work of the Lord, then let me ask, what are you filling your life with? Either you do not think that God is that great or you are too attached to the world. So I'm asking you, can we just put things back into perspective, right? Because the biggest excuse that I hear of why I don't read the Bible, why I don't pray, why I can't come to this event, why I can't volunteer, why I don't want to be in leadership in the church, why I can't come to this or that, is I'm too busy. So let's put everything into perspective for a minute. Do you want to keep doing what is good for you, or do you want to have purpose in your life? Enjoy the work of eternity. Because when we look at the rich young ruler, that's exactly what he says. He says, you know what? I'm too busy. If it costs me too much, I don't want to do it. He decided his stuff was more important than the riches that God had for him. Walter Chantry says this, all of life outside of Christ is for one thing, self. Self is the idol to which all men naturally bow. Andrew Murray, one of my favorite authors, he has to say this. This is a longer quote. He says, we have within us a self that has its poison from Satan, from hell, and yet we cherish it and nourish it. Do you see this? We have within us a self that has its poison from Satan, from hell, and yet we cherish it and nourish it. What do we not do to please self and nourish self? And we make the devil within us strong. Look at your own life. What are the works of hell? They are chiefly these three things. Self-will, self-trust, and self-exaltation. So either your heart is set on what you want or your heart is set on the Lord. And as long as we keep looking to our own preferences and what we want and our self-will, self-trust, and self-exaltation, then we won't be desperate for the Lord. I pray that your heart is this, that you want to join in on what the Lord is doing. Because if you really want to join in on what the Lord is doing, then we need to begin to pray and live in expectation of the Lord Moving. This brings me to my last point. Come expecting. Come expecting. So what's going on here? The disciples, they couldn't believe that the rich young ruler was not good enough. The disciples are still looking at many of the things that we look for, right? He is young. He is wealthy. He is a leader. He is morally good. And the disciples were probably excited that the ruler might join them. They say to themselves, imagine the doors the ruler could open. Imagine the crowds he could bring together. Imagine the travels that he could bankroll. Yet, Jesus sent him away. Jesus keeps the children, but he sends away the ruler. So Jesus responds. Or let me just say, if the ruler wasn't good enough, then the disciples were wondering, okay, then what do you have to do to be saved? And this is how Jesus responds. Jesus looks at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. Salvation in the move of God has nothing to do with wealth and has everything to do with men being humble and willing. And so Peter comes and he says, look, we have left everything and followed you. Peter's going, are we doing the right thing? The ruler didn't do it, but but we did. Is Is this what we're supposed to be doing, Jesus? 
And so Jesus starts to talk about the reward. Look at this. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. When do you receive it? Now. Right now. It says that if you come after God and look and you have to sacrifice stuff when you follow God. No one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake in the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions in the age to come, eternal life. Now, is this suggesting that the prosperity gospel is true, right? That if we follow God, then we will get health, wealth, and prosperity. No, that doesn't make sense. Why doesn't that make sense? Because if I leave a mother, now I have a hundred mothers? That doesn't make sense. What he's saying is essentially that evidently the law shall be a hundred times compensated or made up. Can I just say, how underrated are the joys of the Christian walk? Jesus is talking about eternal life, but notice Jesus is talking about right now, today, in this time. So what must we do? I say that we live and we pray expecting God to move. Because what this is saying is that if we start to follow Jesus, we stop trusting in ourselves, we stop trusting in our resources, we stop trusting in whatever we have, and we say, Jesus, use me however you want to use me. I just want to be a part of what you're doing. says that you will receive 100-fold. Right now, I get to enjoy all the fruit of the Spirit. Right now, I get to enjoy joining in His work. In which if you go, I don't know, why is that so great? Because you were created to worship God. The greatest satisfaction that you can receive because of how you were created is to join in on what God is doing. This means that when you start investing yourself into God in your whole life, you will guarantee it, be satisfied. You will start saying yes to serving him, even if you have to make sacrifices. You will say yes to more prayer, even if you have to make time. When you start saying yes to reading your Bible more, even if it gets difficult to read. When you start saying yes to inviting people to church and to your lives, even if you are shy and don't want to be a bother. Even when, when you start living out the Christian life, you will experience more than you could have ever hoped for on your own. Guarantee it. Jesus says there is not one person who makes these sacrifices that doesn't get a hundredfold now in this time. So we need to start expecting. Part of expecting is you start working knowing that the reward is coming, right? For example, if I'm expecting the president to come to my house, what am I going to do? Probably not sit around going, well, you know, if the president really feels like it. No, I know that he can do it. I know that he's going to come. I'm going to start cleaning my house, right? I'm going to start getting ready for this thing to come. Let me tell you, God has already told you that things are coming. If you will invest, it's happening. So we start expecting. We start living, expecting to God to move. God answers prayers you thought were impossible. You're going to see it. People are going to come to know the Lord because you invested in them. You're going to see it. When you start, you start to gain a deeper understanding of who God is and what God wants to see for your life, you're going to see it, but you have to invest in it. When you say that my life is yours and you start living like it day in, day out, you will start to see exactly what Jesus is talking about. So my question for you is, are you willing to come to God and trust that he really can bring that satisfaction that he's talking about into your life? And I want to end with this. My main application that I want you to take home is come to God like a child. This means you come to Jesus not only when you're at church, not only when you are in a good place, but you come to Jesus all the time. All the time. Look, when you're happy, let him know. When you're mad, let him know. Even if you're mad at him, let him know. 
When you're sad, let them know. When you're going through great depression, let them know. When you get frustrated, let them know. When you're confused, let them know. And everything big and small, you come to him. That's what a child does. Make a child angry. What's the first thing they'll say? I'm so mad at you. They're open and they're honest. That's what God is wanting for you. To fully love, fully trust, and be open with him. Jesus did not die so we could think about him for an hour a week. Jesus died so we could be in relationship with him, join him, and experience real satisfaction. Return back to our purpose that we were created for. That's what the gospel is for. Jesus, who created the world, saw us in our brokenness. And he says, I want those people. So he was born a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose again three days later. So that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And now he's saying that you can have a hundredfold satisfaction now in this time if you would just come to him. So today we're going to pray that we stop trusting in our wealth of resources and pray that God starts to do the impossible through us. And we live expecting him to do so. Will you pray with me? Mm -hmm.